So hello everyone. Uh, so today we are going to discuss about uh, our SD WAN deployment. So um, as part of our SD WAN deployment, we have two major providers. One is uh, Versa Networks based SD WAN service, and the second one is Cisco based SD WAN services. So as part of this training video, we are going to cover uh, Versa SD WAN deployment. What it is? How is it? and uh, what is the benefit that it gets to our uh, CIFI technologies. So to begin with, uh, let's talk about how the SD-WAN architecture is and what are the different components as part of the SD-WAN. So as part of that, let's talk about uh, what uh, this uh, diagram which, is, which, which uh, we are looking at. So let's talk about uh, Versa Director. So Versa Director is basically uh, uh, is one of the SD WAN components wherein it it is used for building configurations, maintaining the reachability to the edge appliances, and Versa Flex VNF is basically the fabric on which we are running all the services of routing, SD WAN, and security. And these are in, uh, in two deployment options. One is on a bare metal, which means it's a, as good as a Cisco router that you look at on a day-to-day -day basis, or on a VM, which can be a KVM-based hypervisor or a VM-based uh, ESXi-based hypervisor. Uh, as you can see over here, there are two deployment options for that. One is appliance and one is cloud. You can also deploy that uh, these VMs in AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. The third component is uh, Versa Analytics. So Versa Analytics is basically your NMS, which gives you rich insights into uh, different type of uh, application flows, traffic flows, URLs, and what is the performance IP SLA between the uh, uh, branch to branch, so and so forth. And so we're going to just discuss uh, much more deeper in the upcoming slides. So let's talk about the director. As I told you, it is a configuration orchestrator and it manages all the deployed CPs centrally. So there is no need to look into multiple management systems to check where is the asset hosted, what is the status of the asset, and is, is there a link uh, down or if the, there's a, there is a BGP flap. All these things can be uh, checked from the director console. So it is a centralized repository from where we can discover newly deployed deployed branch locations which through the method of zero touch provisioning so we're going to discuss more on the zero touch provisioning in the upcoming slides so what why do we call it as pre-configured templates what is a template right so template is nothing but a list of configurations let's say you're bringing up a cisco router right so you configure interface gigabit zero bar zero ip address and so forth so all these things is automated in a way that you just click off a button. It is making all these things possible. So you need not even log in into the CLA of the box to make any change. So it will automate all that and you have to just discover the box to the director. So when we say converting complex configurations in, uh, 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 in network level into uh, user friendly, so that's why we call it, right? So let's say you want to build BGP from the CE router to the PE or you want to build OSPF between the CE router and the customer's router. All these things can be done in a single touch rather than doing it in multiple iterations. So this, this will save a lot of time and as well as the effort in analyzing where the issue is in case of the BGP or the OSPF neighbor doesn't come up. Controller. Controller is the, uh, the brain of the uh, sd wan ecosystem. So Controller is, you can think of controller as a BGP route reflector. So people who are uh, new into the networking domain, uh, you can Google it out. BGP route reflector is a very standard terminology in any of your CCNA, CCNP guidebooks. You can refer on that. So what it does is uh, it basically reflects back whatever routes are learned from one branch location to another branch location. Let's say you have one branch location in Chennai, the other branch location in uh, in Mumbai, so you advertise a new route into the network. Let's say 192.168.10.0 is a subnet you are advertising from Chennai. That is again propagated not directly to the branch appliance. It is relayed by the controller. So controller, what it does, 
it maintains an ipsec session so this is a multi point ipsec session again uh, people who are new to the networking you can refer to the terminologies ipsec uh, dmvpn and get vpn from the networking books and uh, so what we do is it basically builds bgp over ipsec and gets a connection up and running and builds a ibgp between the controller and the edge appliance so again it uh, we'll discuss more on how it does and what it does in the upcoming slides in a more uh, diagrammatic way so this is the director as i uh, as I, was, uh, as i spoke about uh, it gives you a complete life cycle management of the edge, uh, of the hardware it tells you uh, whether the cp is live whether the licenses are going to expire whether the links are up and running whether the protocol is up and running and all the all the information in a centralized place the the uh, the benefit of using this particular vendor is they are uh, very flexible and they are multi tenant so when we call it as multi tenancy the term itself states that we can host multiple tenants in a single box meaning i can have some uh customer a customer b customer c in a single hardware that i have deployed as part of a managed services so it also gives you a centralized application policy management we'll discuss more on that on what is that uh, so on a very high level centralized application policy management is uh defining traffic steering policy per branch stating which are all the customers business critical traffic in in a sense of sap oracle and non business traffic like uh, google facebook twitter and so forth how the traffic should be sent from the branch to the hub location in case if it's a hub and spoke architecture or how the traffic should break out locally using the local internet breakout we'll discuss more on that in the upcoming slides again uh, we can integrate the director with any management tools uh to do the service life cycle management so that's how it is integrated into our ecosystem it is a flexible way of deploying and uh, managing physical and virtual appliances and the cloud appliances on a triage so basically you can manage your cps which are deployed in vmware cps which are deployed as a physical hardware and the cps which are deployed as part of cloud instances in aws azure and gcp moving on a bit more detail into the controller as i explained you earlier so every time a branch is discovered the controller authenticates the branch using the certificates as part of the ike exchange so either you can use a certificate or you can use a pre shared key between only during the discovery time and later on all that keys is dynamically generated it establishes a secure tunnel between the branch at all the versa core nodes meaning sd wan controller director and analytics so at any point of time this is so secure that uh, at any point of time your director and analytics do not directly talk to the branch location so as as i told you controller maintains the tunnel and bgp to the edge appliance it so all the traffic always comes to the controller before reaching to the director or the analytics so in this way we are reducing the exposure and uh, protecting our network and the data collected from the customers network secure right so that's why we call it as a centralized uh, uh, place where we attach all the overlay wan network so again uh, we have an option to choose on how the traffic is forwarded from the branch to the controller uh based on uh uh based on whether it should be sent on a secure channel or just the vxlan encapsulation is fine but it's always recommended and as part of our deployment we always send it using an encrypted channel and uh, so again an ipsec sa is established between the controller and the edge appliance on top of that we build a mp ibgp so that's how uh, it gets to know what is the branch what are the number of links available on the branch let's say you have one mpls link and one internet link right so how do i reach to this branch using these two subnets all that information is captured in the initial site discovery process and that's how the uh, sdn controller intelligently tells you 
what is the name of the branch what are what are the number of van links available on the branch and whether it's behind a nat or it's be does it have a static ip So based on this optimization, right? So we uh, we reduce the number of uh, tunnels required to form, and uh, so uh, let's talk about let's talk about uh, the key exchange mechanism here, right? So uh, what happens is every time we generate a new pair of keys to form IPsec with the remote SD-WAN router. Right. So by this, we are just reducing the number of keys that are required to maintain IPsec SAs with say X amount of branches. Let's say a customer comes up, he says, "I have hundred locations." So I'm I'm not I'm going to generate hundred security pair keys and keep them rotating, so that even if my uh, SD WAN device is compromised, that keys keeps changing on the configured rekey interval time. So at a point of time, uh, you can have a, li a link connected on one internet link, uh, or you can have a dual internet link. But as part of the staging, post-staging, uh, we discover the appliance only using one physical link. It can be a 4G uh, broadband or a public IP or an MPLS IP. We do not care about that. So we'll talk more about uh, the types of network interfaces available in uh, the controller and the branch router. So uh, we'll just skip on to the next step. Let's talk about uh, SD-WAN analytics. So what are the high level features covered as part of SD-WAN analytics? It comprises of big data engine, which gives you a more reliable database on correlation and how it leverages the Cassandra database to give a multi-tenant analytics platform for uh, service providers like us. It has a logging framework wherein it can capture different formats of IPFIX, syslog, and it also has a feature to export these logs to a third-party collector. So you, you can collect all the data from the branches, keep it in a centralized place, and from here you can relate to your uh, customer-specific third-party collector locations. Uh, you have reports, various kinds of reports, so we are just not limited to the five pointers that we see over here, like pertinent per appliance reports, time series reports, uh, geolocation based reports, traffic utilization, protocol anomaly detection, that is security, and uh, so you can basically predict and uh, tell the customer that, okay, man, see, this is your network, we see a spike in the network utilization, so it's a good time for you to upgrade your link bandwidth. So you can go back to the customer and say whenever there is a need on how do you, uh, on based on how do you extract the data from the analytics. So uh, again, uh, we can download all these reports in CSV, PDF and XLS formats. And also there is an option to uh, send out an email uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, again, uh, we leverage heavily on the REST APIs for collecting the interface graphs from the analytics and giving it as giving it as part of our Akash portal. And uh, <clears throat> again, uh, it does log archiving every seven days and so forth. So the, uh, we'll discuss more on that. Uh, security reports. So security reports is uh, basically uh, again it is not limited to just what you see over here. It's more. Uh, just to give a high level view, uh, it captures L7 applications, URL categories based on uh, IP reputation, URL reputation, and uh, what all applications are the top bandwidth consuming applications on the branch, what are the top source IP on the branch which is consuming the highest amount of bandwidth, and what are the top destination IPs to which they are trying to browse or access. Again, uh, zone based firewalls, we can see what are the hit number of hits for the zone based firewalls. Network reports, top, uh, as I told you, it gives you a full-fledged report. Uh, we'll discuss more on what are the silent features available as part of SD-WAN plus SD security. But yeah, so SD-WAN supports a full set of features of routing SD-WAN and security, which is NGFW plus UTM. So we cover application filtering, URL filtering, anomaly protection using uh, anomaly protection using IPS, malware protection and antivirus using network based antivirus uh, inspection. 
So let's talk about Versa Flex VNF. SVN branch uh, consists of Flex VNF. So this is the common terminology which you'll see when you get to work and get hands-on on the SDN appliances. Uh, so SD1 uh, Flex VNF is basically a software which runs within uh, every VM of uh, SD1, every appliance of SD1, and every uh, cloud VM of SD1. So this is basically the core engine of the SD1. So it is a more flexible way of delivering uh, the services. As you can see, there is a Versa distributed fabric, which is uh, on top of which there is a Versa OS uh, running, which is basically, so when we say Versa distributed fabric, the underlay is a customized Ubuntu. On top of it, they run the OS of Versa and they give services, which are called as uh, C uh, virtual CPE, routing, uh, full-fledged routing, NAT capability, firewall, UTM, uh, SD-WAN, and uh, any NFEs, like uh, you can even launch a FortiGate or a Palo Alto firewall within the SD-WAN VM, so that's the level of flexibility. And it can also give you, it also gives you the benefit of clubbing two different types of network into one. So basically you can have one internet link and one MPLS link. And at the same time, uh, these both can be clubbed together for sending traffic from the branch to the hub location. So basically, as part of our CV deployment, <clears throat> the head end components, first our director, analytics, and controller uh, are hosted to be enabled, are hosted and enabled to be reachable on um, both the transports, which is basically MPLS and internet. And all these components work in conjunction to actually give us a, uh, the overall SD WAN uh, service to the customer. Right? So, again, we have it as a distributed uh, network services that supports multi-tenancy, meaning, as I told you, all the components in SD-WAN is multi-tenant. Let it be director, controller, and analytics. Everything is multi-tenant. Same goes for the uh, SD-WAN Flex VNF. So, Flex VNF is the same OS which is going to run on the branch appliance and also which is running on the controller. So, that's how we call it as a controller and the branch is called as a branch. <laughs> so what are the features of uh, SD-WAN Flex VNF CP variant? So we're not going to talk about controller because controller is restricted to just act as a route reflector, just act as an intelligent source of uh, location where you just give me some routing information. So I'm the branch, I'll take care of all the so that's the whole idea of SDN, right? So we just take an abstraction out of it, get this done. So routing services, uh, it supports a full suite of uh, routing, like OSPF, PGP, uh, static, and they have also recently added a feature uh, called a feature uh, for RIP. I know RIP, uh, many people have stopped using it, but still there are some leg legacy customers who would require that. For them, it is already, already there. Uh, it supports, uh, um, so as I told, full feature support, provider aid services, route reflector. So basically, you can even deploy a SVN router to a customer and say, hey man, see, you can take my router, make it work like a route reflector. Okay. And it supports a full fledged, so we call it as a full core NAT. So people are new to networking, uh, I would refer them to go to uh, just refer some Cisco blogs or Juniper blogs and study about uh, NAT. So a full core NAT is basically a NAT which supports a bi directional, NAT capability in any hardware. So sd one supports, uh, Versa sd one supports that. So we can do different types of NAT. We can do an inbound NAT, we can do an outbound NAT, we can do a port translation, uh, we can do a uh, IPv6 translation uh, and so forth. And we can do a double NAT as well. So security services, uh, as I told you, we do application detection, uh, URL uh, detection, DNS detection, IPS IDS, which is basically an only, so you can read more on that. Layer 3 and Layer 4 firewall is nothing but uh, people who are aware of the TCP uh, IP stack or the OSA stack, they will know that uh, Layer 3, Layer 4 is nothing but IP and ports. So we do IP and port level filtering. Network antivirus and anti-malware services, so we basically understand uh, if it is a malicious packet or not and then block it. Next generation firewall is nothing but a collage of all these features combined together is called as a next generation firewall. 
So next generation firewall handles all the traffic all the way from L7 to L3. A stateful firewall handles traffic only from L3 to L4. So that is the only difference. Unified threat management is nothing but a combined... It, it, it is like, I, I will say like, okay, man, you are a CEO, you have a VP, you have a manager, right? So similarly, you have a unified threat management, CEO. You have a next generation firewall, VP. Okay, then you have a, a, a um, then you then you have a a smaller version of it. You call it as a stateful firewall or an uh, next generation firewall. So sorry, next generation firewall and a subset of that, let's say manager, team leader, right? So he is a stateful firewall. So that's the hierarchy. I would say unified threat management is nothing but which can cover the entire scale of the network security. Plus, it can give you basic firewall features as well. Network features, uh, SDR uh, sub, uh, router supports, uh, DHCP on the LAN side. You can do a uh, you can do a hierarchical QoS. You can do BFD both on your customer facing side and as well as on the service provider facing side. You have VRRP or router level higher high, high availability. So this is just a glimpse on how the SD WAN components looks like. The top, as you can see, the brown dotted lines always uh, goes and connects to the controller because controller is the single most entry point for any data, any communication, any control communication. Let me uh, reiterate again. Controller is never used for data forwarding, meaning let's say towards my left, I have a data center. Towards my right, I have a spoke location. If the data center or the uh, let's say the spoke, the spoke wants to access the SAP server, the data path is going to be using the hybrid network data path alone. You see the green line over there which shows active active. That is a line it is going to take which is basically pure underlay network which can be uh, when we say hybrid network it is nothing but a combination of CIFI MPLS internet and any other third party MPLS provider. Okay, so that's the combination or any third party internet services. It is just going to be using their links. So it is not going to happen that the spoke location is sending the data traffic to controller. It is sending it back to the data center. No, it doesn't work like that. Controller is only for relaying intelligent information, which means it will relay what is the IPsec parameters to, to establish between the DC and the spoke. What all are the applications that are getting browsed in the DC and the spoke is collected by the controller. It is given to the analytics. So that is collected using the protocol called as IPfix. So you can read more on IPfix in Google. On a short term note, I have just given a definition over here. Director, how does director talk to the appliances? So this might be a question everyone might be having, right? A director communicates the edge appliances via the controller using a protocol called as NetConf. So again, NetConf is a widely used protocol uh, in our upcoming technologies. You can learn more about NetConf in the, by just googling it out. But on a very short note, it is a flexible way of uh, configuring uh, edge appliance. It is more flexible than SSH. Uh, basically, in SSH, you just do a copy paste. That's how you bring up your CP router, right? So, uh, just to uh, add on top of that, right? So, this gives you much more uh, flexibility. So, coming back to a, a deep diving into the network. So, what is uh, what are the different protocols used in SD WAN, right? So, so VXLAN is the the most uh, thing which you cannot avoid that is uh, mandatorily there. The next one is IPsec. Uh, so when we say IPsec, it is a multi-point IPsec, it is not a point-to-point -point IPsec. Uh, then it is NetConf and the next one is IPfix. So I've just uh, given a note over here on how the communication is happening between the head and components, director, controller and analytics to the edge appliance. You can refer to this table. I'll just pause for like 10 seconds so that you can go through it. I'll just move on to the next slide after this. Okay. 
So, uh, okay, this is just again trying to boost the features of Versa Flex VNF. So uh, let's talk a, a bit about what are the features available as part of uh, sd right? So, so it's an x86 based platform, uh, which means it is a flexible way of deploying any uh, this sd service on any open platform. You can upgrade to any advanced features without uh, having a worry to uh, buy a paper license, install the license and so forth. You get a subscription based license. Uh, you can just subscribe for the service. We'll just enable that for you. Automated provisioning and policy push. So uh, sd router can, uh, uh, can be automated. The configuration can be automated and pushed via centralized sd director. It can measure end-to-end -end SLA, which is basically latency, jitter, and loss between your sd wan appliance to sd wan appliance transport VR. It is for traffic encryption for sensitive traffic which is sent over internet and MPLS. It can give you a NAT, so it can give you a full fledged NAT as we discussed earlier. Reporting enhancements, it can give you a, SLA, uh, it can give you a full fledged reporting so we're going to run uh, more on that vpn segmentation it is like uh, you can have a multi sub vrf within every sd wan box so this uh, this can be thought of as a multi vrf service that we deliver to our customers like customer buys a multiple multi vpn from the service provider to service multiple customers within them so with sd wan within the sd wan box you can build a vrf so that vrf will have a dedicated route table Right, so that route table, if you want, you can do interlinking or you can have it, have it as a dedicated route table only for that VLAN segment. Example, HR and uh, marketing team, they do not want to talk to each other, right? So you can have them on a separate routing VR altogether. And the same uh, overlay segment will be given to you across your overlay VPN as well. It can give you application-based traffic steering, performance-aware routing, application-based traffic shaping features. We'll discuss more on that when we define some policies. Uh, let's talk a bit more on uh, what are the building blocks for versus solution. So as we discussed earlier, it gives you a full-fledged of multi-tenant capability and uh, you can have multiple per tenant policies, per tenant customizations available. That makes it more relevant for us as a service provider. It gives per tenant RBAC policies, which can, uh, RBAC is nothing but role-based access features, uh, by which we can give different types of administrative accounts for each tenant. Let's talk uh, about Versa's network interfaces naming convention, VNI. VNI is nothing but virtual network interface. It is as good as a physical interface like you have it in your Cisco or HPMSR routers, like Gigabit 0 bar 1, 0 bar 2 and so forth. Here we call it as VNI 0 bar 0, 0 bar 1, 0 bar 2, 0 bar 3 and so forth. Uh, and all these interfaces in the backend, they are mapped as ETH1, ETH2, ETH3, ETH4. This is just for your reference, but from a provisioning standpoint, you would just require the physical links, which is VNI 0 bar 0 and 0 bar 1 and so forth. TVI, Tunnel Virtual Interface. It is basically like we can consider it as a loopback interface. Why do I call it as a loopback interface, right? Because it is used to form a tunnel from your branch appliance towards the controller. So every branch location will have two TVIs, which is TVI VXLAN and TVI ESP. So that's what you uh, see over here. So you have a point to multi point VXLAN tunnel and point to multi point ESP tunnel. It is used to form uh, uh, used to form and forward traffic from one branch to the other using either the VSLAN and the ESP encryption. PTVA, pseudo tunnel virtual interface. So pseudo tunnel interface is formed after your IPsec is built using the TVI interfaces. 
So for every uh, controller, we have one PTVI interface. So if you have two controllers in your SD WAN routers, you should be able to see two PTVI tunnels up. So if the, if the PTVI is up, it means the IPsec session towards the controller is up. Okay. And also, as we spoke, point to multi point tunnels are created, right? So, which means uh, you can see point to multi point PTVI tunnels as well getting created for every branch node if it is a full mesh architecture. Pair TVI. Pair TVI uh, is nothing but a logic, it, it is a flexible way by which we can do routing within the SD WAN domain, which is used to, uh, let's say, you can put one. TVI pair TVI interface in one transport VR, one TVI pair TVI interface in LAN VR, and you can leak routes between them using BGP or static routing. So it is a flexible way of uh, interleaking the routes. Right. So as we discussed earlier, uh, we are doing, so let's say uh, the left side router one has a TVI interface 0 bar 0 with an IP address of 10.1. 1.1 and the VNI IP is 0, uh, VNI 0 bar 1 IP is 172.1.1.1. Now, uh, over here, to reach 21.2.2.2, uh, there is a static route written that the next stop is at 10.1.1, TVI 0 bar 0. Okay, so here it is a, uh, now if you can see on the left side top, Instance type is virtual router, okay, and the protocol called over here is BGP, but for forwarding this traffic, they are using static routing. As you can see in the bottom, there is a static route written for forwarding traffic from branch router 1 to router 2. Now, the VNI is used to forward the traffic between the IP networks. The TVI is basically the IP second tunnel interface between the branch to branch which forms over the underlay network. So when we say underlay, you can think about it as an MPLS underlay, a internet underlay or a 4G based underlay. Okay. On top of that, we are building IPsec. So it's a common terminology, right? So if you learn about IPsec, you know how IPsec is built. The similar term technology is used over here. No, no change. So, if you see, uh, there is an Ike, which is uh, nothing but uh, internet key exchange over TVI interface, which is done. And uh, once that is done, there is a PTVI, which is created for the IP6 session. Let's talk about different types of routing instances in uh, uh, Versa SD1. So, the first routing instance is virtual router, which is used for forming underlay which which can be used for uh, underlay traffic which is basically you, know, you can have a virtual router MPLS, virtual router internet and a virtual router control VR. So all the MPBGB functionality or normal underlay functionality is done only in the virtual router. Virtual router forwarding is uh, nothing but like a pure router like how you have a VRF flight in Cisco terminologies if I would say. Right. So, on top of that, let's talk about VPN VRF. Right. So, you do a, a RT and RD. Right. So, that's uh, so this virtual router forwarding is like a miniature version of VPN VRF, which basically uses uh, uh, like I'll discuss more on that, but uh, it's just for routing per se as part of SD-WAN deployment, which is used to just forward traffic based on IP lookup. So here's a detailed explanation on what are different types of virtual routing instances and uh, virtual router forwarding instances. So every interfaces or networks which gets created will be mapped to the virtual routers and virtual router forwarding instances respectively. Virtual router forwarding interfaces will always face towards customer's LAN segment and virtual routers will always face towards the uh, underlay network connectivity that is MPLS and internet based links. So every interface in Versa SD WAN is called as a zone. Uh, the LAN interface is always called as a trust zone. WAN interface, which is MPLS or internet, it is called as an untrust zone. 
So we can define traffic steering uh, security policies based on zones, based on the these naming references. So we're going to discuss about SD-WAN zero touch provisioning. So you might be uh, reading a lot about it. So uh, what is zero touch provisioning? Zero touch provisioning is the minimalistic configuration required for you to bring up a network device up and running into the network. So that's the whole concept of zero touch provisioning. As part of that, there are two stages to perform the zero touch provisioning. So one is a staging wherein uh, the CP gets authenticated with the controller and says, hey man, this is me, I'm the serial number and I belong to this organization. Give me the uh, access to get in connected to their network. Right. So once this information is received as part of the ZTP, right, so what happens is uh, as soon as you break up the network on the branch, you will send a field engineer. A field engineer, he will have a CP router with him. He will connect the CP router with the CS link or internet link. Right? Now what will happen? The branch, you will run a ZTP script. What it will tell? Well, it is going to tell what is your controller's public IP or private IP, where you should go and talk and ask whether you are a valid CP or not. Right? So as soon as this information is fed, immediately uh, within the next 10 to 15 seconds, the CP will uh, try to reach to this controller's public IP or private IP and build a IPsec as soon as it is reachable. So now, once the IPsec is built, there is some interesting things which it captures. So it captures uh, a few parameters like uh, what is a branch serial number right? and what is the IP address of this branch. So this information, the controller receives it and gives it to the director and tells the ten, and it communicates to the director and tells, hey man, see, you, you have got uh, a branch appliance with the following serial number, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and with the public IP 115.210.214.10, uh, can you check which organization it belongs to, right? So the director checks and it tells, okay, I have this organization belonging to SIFI. I'll take this, please give him this uh, post-staging configuration. Right. So what this post-staging con consists is the final set of configuration which is required for the branch, which means whether you have a PEC EBGP, whether you have a P uh, uh, between the SD-WAN router and the customer appliance, do you have a BGP or any SD-WAN traffic steering policy, security policy that you have configured, pre-configured and kept. All that configuration is pushed at once by the by the director via the controller to the edge appliance, right? So now the in the post staging, the branch appliance receives a full fledged config, and now it installs the config and reboots. A uh, lot of people have a question: Why does it reboot? Why is it required? So basically, it is a best practice just to ensure that any deviation which you're doing in the configuration, right? So sometimes people can give a wrong IP address and it tries to keep the control session up and running. All that deviation, why do you want to do it? You just want a hassle-free uh, way to get these things done, right? So that's the whole point of zero touch provisioning. So just get the config, delete all the control con connections you have, and now once the CP router reboots and comes up, it is again going to form IPsec with the controller, but right now it knows which organization it belongs to, it forms IPsec with that organization, and downloads the routes and uh, captures the routing information. So, uh, SD-WAN staging. Right? So, as I, as I spoke about uh, SD-WAN staging, stage 1, stage 2, and stage 3, uh, we just spoke about in the earlier, uh, just a bit earlier, right? So, uh, so this is a detailed steps on how it's going to happen. I'm just going to take you through a presentation uh, which is going to explain zero touch provisioning. Yeah, so we have a hybrid WAN network, so I've just represented it as a CFI MPLS. So this is CFI MPLS is connected to SD WAN controller and SD WAN staging controller. So in the bottom, you see there are uh, different colored appliances. So C represents uh, Cisco based appliances, V represents the Versa based appliances. So let's see how a new branch, when it comes to the for the staging, what are, what are the steps uh, it takes to form uh, IPsec? So, our vendor ships a box to the customer's location. 
Now, the field engineer who goes to the customer side connects the WAN link. Now, CPE, it knows which is the staging controller's IP. It tries to communicate with that. Right? So now, uh, after the communication is successfully established, it is going to form an IPsec. It has formed an IPsec, so there is something called as a two-factor authentication. So there is a two-factor authentication which happens, uh, which basically sends out an email and a SMS to the system administrator who is onboarding that appliance to validate whether the CPE is legit or not. So once they approve it, the staging controller notifies the staging director and gives a information on what is your controller's IP address. So now, it gets the config, it reboots. So now it came back up, it tried to contract to the controller and it established an IPsec tunnel with the controller and it downloads the post-staging config. So now in this method, what happens is the CP router is talking to the director directly uh, via the controller but now it is talking to its own organization. Earlier it was talking to the CFE provider organization and now it is talking to the actual customer organization. Now once the CFE comes, now it's put routes available in the network. That is how do I communicate to the locations which are via the SD-MAN overlay. It, it gets that information from the controller. Now it knows how to reach them. It forms an IPsec. So there is a direct P2P, uh, a point to multi-point IPsec established between the Versa a branch and all other remote branches and the controller and the data forwarding starts flowing directly. <clears throat> On a low level, right? so this is how the controller would look like. If you can see, this is the SD-WAN controller. It has two transports. So when I say transport, uh, it has two uh, routers like a virtual router one virtual router is connected to MPLS one virtual router is connected to internet okay so what happens where this VRF VR it can talk to all locations which are on internet all SUN locations and where this via virtual router it can talk to all the location which are part of one MPLS segment okay similarly on the branch level if you see, there is two transport VRs, VR meaning virtual router, VRF meaning virtual router forwarding. I'll explain more, more on that. So this branch also has one MPLS VR and one internet VR, right? So which means this branch can talk to a MPLS and internet based location. Control VR, right? So what is control VR? Control VR is basically the location from where it will try to form uh, IPsec plus MPIPGP with the controller's control VR. So now, uh, since we know about the virtual routers and the interfaces associated with it, right? so let's see how the branch node communicates with the controller via the TVI ESP and the TXLAN ESP, how they exchange the IC, how they form the IPsec and how on top of IPsec a BGP is built and furthermore once the data traffic starts forwarding between the branch V1 and V2 we are going to see how it collects the IP fix information and sends it to the analytics. So the IC is initiated from the VXL TVI towards the controller's VXL TVI. Now IC exchange is done, ISA KMP is built. Now once ISA KMP is built, IPsec phase 2 is done completed. It forms a phase 2 IPsec using ESP TVI with the controller. Now you see the PTVI 0 bar 1 is live. See over here, right? PTVI ESP is formed. Right? So now uh, the branch to controller session is established. Now, since the session is established, the director also gets to know that okay, this branch is reachable for me. It, say, it builds a netcom session via the controller to the branch flags. Now an MP VGP is uh, <coughs> built between the controller and the uh, the flags. Now, let's
never see the similar behavior for branch B2. Similarly, it is forming an Ike session over MPLS link using VXLAN TBI to the controller. And now the Ike session is built. Next, ESP TBI gets established. Now your PTVI 0 bar 1 is up on the second router as well. Now then there is a net conf exchange between the director and the branch. Okay, so now we got to know that it is reachable. Now an MPBGP is initiated from the branch to the controller. And controller relays that okay, there is a new branch on uh, available and here is the routing information for that. So once the routing information is there, you see a purple line which is basically the SLA gets formed and the data traffic starts flowing. So the black box which you see is the data traffic. Now it knows that there is some data traffic running. The data collected using IP fix is sent to the analytics. So that's how the data forwarding keeps flowing between the branch to branch. And let's say in case of MPLS link fails, there's a notification that is sent to the direct uh, sent, and now the traffic immediately gets shifted from MPLS to internet, and that's how the end to end traffic flow works. Similarly, if the internet path fails, the traffic flows via the MPLS path. So, uh, let's talk about uh, SD-WAN site and transport domains. So, SD-WAN site is, uh, as we discussed earlier, in zero-touch provisioning, it, it plays a significant role. A site ID is unique to the SD-WAN site, which means the, the, the site ID can start from one, uh, 100 and go all the way up to 500 or 5000 and so forth. But every site ID has to be unique from the other. Which means, uh, and you cannot have an overlapping site ID uh, per tenant. So basically, you can have, let's say, 100 to 200 for customer A, 201 to 300 for customer B, but you cannot have the same 100 to 300 for the third customer. So it has to be a unique site ID for every customer to maintain the uniqueness of the branch. Transport domain. So transport domain is to ensure that any transport domain, let's say MPLS, is not trying to form an SLA with a internet-based transport domain or a third-party MPLS-based transport domain. It basically restricts and tells the branch appliance, you only try to form a SLA with a location which has the same transport ID as you. Let's say my transport ID is MPLS with the transport ID as 10. So, the branch router will always try to form SLA with the remote branch router which also has the transport ID as 10 with the transport domain name as MPLS. It is just for that and also the data path forwarding relies on this information. So, uh, we are going to discuss about SLA measurement. So, as we discussed in the earlier section that uh, how as we discussed in the earlier section, how SD1 SLA monitoring is measured, that as uh, every probe is sent out every 10 seconds and we wait for three times of it to declare a path dead. Right? So I told you there is another section which is called SD1 traffic steering, where you define what is the SLA interval where you can modify that and steer the traffic more efficiently. So SLA measurement in SD1 is done using a protocol called as Y1731, which is a standard IEEE uh, based uh, mechanism but the, it is a modified variant which is used in our Versa sd wan deployment. So as part of this there is a probe which is sent and it, it gets a reply back which by which it is a unidirectional probe. So let's say on one side you have configured monitoring interval as 10, the other side you have configured monitoring interval as 2 and the loss threshold is 3. So the both the site location uh, SLA path will be down. Why? Because there is no negotiation which is happening between the boxes. Each box sends out an individual probe and gets a reply back for that. That's it. So if you set a SLA interval as 10 seconds on one side and 2 seconds on the other side, it's not going to form SLA and it, the path is going to be 
down. So also always ensure that uh, your SD-WAN SLA monitoring interval is same between the two talking routers. Next, so you can define SLA probe based on every queue. So let's say a customer wants to understand whether there is a latency jitter on the EFQ. You can enable SLA monitoring on the EFQ as well. So now customer can get to know whether there is queue level jitter, queue level latency on all those parameters. And the measurement that we do today is more than uh, what's listed down here, which is latency jitter packet loss and uh, link utilization based on RX and DX. Plus we can also do inline loss measurement meaning if you are sending 10 ping packets from site A to site B if there are 5 packets lost before the packet reaches site B the site B will signal back to the site A that I only received 5 so now the SLA counter under forward loss ratio will be increased to 5 so now you now uh, compared to other vendors now we can say that we, we get to know how many data packets are lost compared to the synthetic packets which is SLA probes which are getting lost so let's uh, the next slide is about uh, how the traffic measurement is calculated so this is a standard way on how uh, SD-WAN SLA measurement is done so there is a as I told SD-WAN SLA is a unidirectional probe. So on my left side, which is branch 1, WAN link 1, it will initiate a message, a server message to the remote peers, whichever it is talking to. On let's say in our case, it is branch 2, WAN link 1. Now, if you see on the left side, there is timestamp when it's sending the traffic and the timestamp it is receiving the traffic. So based on this, which is VSR, server reply, it is going to understand what is my uh, what is my response time and what is the timestamp associated with it? By this, I get to know what is the latency and packet loss that has been observed for the traffic that is sent from branch one to branch two, and what is the reply coming back. So, in the bottom, if you see, there is two-way delay, which is uh, there is a measurement on how it is calculated, right? So, it is measured based on RX timestamp minus TX timestamp, right? and your forward delay which is basically your jitter so forward delay and reverse delay so how do you derive jitter right so that's the biggest question the highest of forward and reverse delay is your jitter value so that's uh, you can get this info from your SD-WAN analytics portal uh, which will give you a more granular view on what is the historical events like at which point of time there was a spike in the latency or a loss observed uh, to troubleshoot this further. Thank you. So, on my left side, which is branch one, WAN link one, it will initiate a message, a server message to the remote peers, whichever it is talking to. On let's say in our case, it is branch two, WAN link one. Now. If you see on the left side, there is timestamp when it's sending the traffic and the timestamp it is receiving the traffic. So based on this, which is VSR, server reply, it is going to understand what is my uh, what is my response time and what is the timestamp associated with it. By this, I get to know what is the latency and packet loss that has been observed for the traffic that is sent from branch 1 to branch 2 and what is the reply coming back. So in the bottom, if you see, there is two-way delay, which is uh, there is a measurement on how it is calculated, right? So it is measured based on RX timestamp minus TX timestamp, right? And your forward delay, which is basically your jitter. So forward delay and reverse delay. So how do you derive jitter, right? So that's the biggest question. The highest of forward and reverse delay is your jitter value. So that's, uh, you can get this info from your SD-WAN analytics portal, uh, which will give you a more granular view on what is the historical events, like at which point of time there was a spike in the latency or a loss observed uh, to troubleshoot this further. Thank you.